My name is Kevin Davani. This is a Total Connector show. My very, very special guest today is Alexander Svetsky. I've been following him for quite some time. Hi, Alex. How are you doing? Welcome to my show. Good, man. Thank you. I'm freezing my tits off here. It's actually cold. We landed on the coldest day of the year, um, apparently. So. Okay, this is really weird because when I think of Australia, I'm like thinking, wow, you know, this is like super heated and... <laughs> well, you know what? Normally it is. And it's probably me just being a pussy anyway. So like I'm, I'm calling cold like, I don't know, <laughs> seven degrees or whatever. So yes, I can feel you, man. Yeah, I can feel you. <laughs> so Alex, um, I mean, your bio is just, I don't even know where to start. I printed it out even so I can, you know, do markings and... Um, and just you know, give you like give the audience, give my listeners and viewers a bigger picture. Okay, I have an easy bio. I have an easy bio. Just say he's the angry Bitcoin guy. <laughs> no, you're a little bit more than that. And if I may, I'll just uh, even do some screen sharing. It's uh, this is one for the YouTube, but of course, you know, um, uh, uh, as we go along. Now your uh, ha your Twitter handle is at Alex Vetsky. If anyone yeah. wants. Uh, follow you it's like great uh, you know twitter threads you have posts it's it's great stuff and then you have you know a bunch of articles which uh, really i could i would really suggest to anyone go on hackernoon.com or on uh, medium.com slash at alexander svetsky it's the same uh, handle right at alexander svetsky exactly and the last article was just mind blowing. Even you know the last one, that why Bitcoin matters, uh, or this one, Homo sapiens evolution, money and Bitcoin. So, Alex, I mean the reason, and because it all comes together now, and um, from your perspective, and I, I love one of your quotes because it sounds so holistic. It says here after you know you 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 ran a bunch of companies, and you know you went to Silicon Valley, you know you have even a very uh, is it true like a mathematical background right you have your entrepreneur mathematical background yeah i did um math has always been my strong suit ever, ever since i was young I, ha I haven't done any applied mathematics um mm -hmm. since I was in the 10 years ago but i think math is just something that i don't think um leaves you or at least the um the logic element of math uh doesn't leave you i think um you know you, you need to keep if, if you're going to be applying mathematics to you know your job your role or whatever you're doing you need to obviously keep doing it but yeah math is something i love i think it's just it's, it's fundamental to to everything exactly yeah so you once said um it formed a consensus between my entrepreneurial spiritual technological and philosoph philosophical predispositions and now i mean you've 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 created uh or you you're you've founded and and you're the ceo of um the company amber uh, how would you describe that? Just a you know short description. What is Amber? What does it do? What's the benefit? You know, value that's giving to the to your clients to to the people in general. Yeah. Look, really simply, I, I want to help a million people in the world uh, hold some Bitcoin, and I want to make that process as easy as possible. I, you know, I've been telling people to buy Bitcoin for for a number of years now, and generally, uh, it's in the too hard basket. Uh, what's a wallet? What's a this? I don't exchange. It's too much money. It's too volatile. It's too expensive. This, that. Um, yeah, and then you've also got the, the, the traditional unit bias. It's like, oh, I can't afford a whole Bitcoin, you know, despite the fact that it's the most divisible type of money we know of. And so I just wanted to make it as simple as possible. So we started with the notion of, you know, swapping your spare change, um, into Bitcoin and we're releasing a slightly more, um, uh, how can I say Bitcoin a friendly version next month where you don't need to link your account. So to swap the spare change, but what you can do is you can just set up automated uh, purchases out of your account. So it's kind of like dollar cost averaging your way in and you know, you've got it on the screen now, which is stacking stats, which I kind of stole from Marty Bent and um, Matt Odell because <laughs> shout out to the two boys for um, really coining that term and, and building it up. But really I, I just want to bring this concept of, you know, stacking sats into people's minds. I, I bought a little domain name called Sense to Sats. And, you know, we, we're really going to want to drive this idea that, you know, th th there's a new movement happening and it's, it's, it's not only just a new form of money, but it's, 
I, I met with some people from Deloitte today, for example, and, and they were talking about, uh, you know, one of them had used to work at American Express and just talked about the, you know, the, the whole American Express club, how people, you know, hold it in the front of their wallet just so they can feel like they're part of the club. And I said, you know, it's really interesting that, you know, you've got that same sort of thing in, in Bitcoin is the, this whole 21 million club, which, um, you know, that there's only going to be so much of these, you know, Bitcoins ever uh, produced um, programmatically. And, you know, we have an opportunity now as these early adopters to be truly a part of that club. Um, because everyone, assuming Bitcoin becomes a primary um, monetary sort of operating system for the world, um, you know, everyone at some point is going to be holding some sats. Um, but, you know, there's going to be a few of us who are holding full Bitcoins and that's going to be special. So that, that's the plan for the app. Um, really, you know, there's, I got annoyed over 2017. Um, I think there was so much noise, so much stupidity, so much, you know, idiots just running around making the, this, I guess I'm the reason people call me angry, Alex is like, I, I, you know, get really angry when hypocrisy comes, um, you know, comes to the fore of, you know, new innovations. And, you know, we had this thing called Bitcoin come out and it was this, social call it a technology call it whatever you want to uh to disintermediate um you know parties that were you know rent seeking or whatever and it was it was to bring some more symmetry back into society so that you don't have people who can go out there and print money and then these morons took that narrative and applied it to icos and you know under the guise of decentralization or whatever other stupid word they you know try to put they actually went and did everything that Bitcoin was created to stop, i.e. they printed money, you know, they had their own senior drive, they did all this sort of crap. So, um, yeah, like my whole thing with Amber is to buck that trend and come back to sanity, which is we don't need, you know, blockchain for fucking this and that. And, you know, we don't need all of this dumb ideas that are out there. We just need to start with a, a monetary base. We need to reinvent you know, what money, everything else will come after. Um, and, and this is what the fundamental innovation is here. And, you know, fundamentally, the most important applications in the marketplace today are on ramps. And the better and more useful those on ramps can be, um, the more people we're going to get onto, you know, holding some Bitcoin. And it's, it's, it's amazing how much more receptive people are to learning about what Bitcoin is when they have some skin in the game, you know. You can talk to someone until you're blue in the face if they don't hold any, but you know, when they have a hundred bucks, watch them start looking at the chart, watch them start reading some articles, watch them start talking to people about it. Then they're interested. So it's it's sort of my- they, they're lacking the experience. Yeah. And this is, I think what you're doing with Amber is, is finally, because this is what I've been, you know, I've been sort of preaching, you know, it's like, Hey guys, I mean, break down these technical barriers and technical terminology language. Uh, people are overwhelmed. They don't have the time, the resources, the energy. They have lives. You know, they got to work. Uh, and then the, all the brainwashing by the, you know, by whatever mainstream media and and you know all these idiots out there. Uh, people cannot cannot really even imagine, you know, let alone really comprehend what what we can create with this monetary root layer, as I would call it, Bitcoin. And uh, you know, so this goes again back to my core question. Um, uh, first of all, yeah, I mean, this is what, this is great what you're doing. You're actually really breaking it down and you, you're simplifying the process. You're doing it. It's about easy, user-friendly access and, you know, applications and use yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the word. Access is the key word, man. Access is the key word. Like, I, I was talking to someone. I said, you know, this is supposed to, Bitcoin's supposed to be this permissionless network that is accessible by anyone. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, it'd be accessible by any one piece is, you know, relatively difficult. Now, that, that's, you know, partly technical, partly noise in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, if, if we can help smooth that along and fix a couple of those issues, then I'm, I'm really happy. Whether it's a million people I get on, whether it's 10 million, whatever the case is, just the more people that have Bitcoin, the happier I am. And okay. Sure. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> So it brings me back, um, as I told you before, previous before we started off, I told you I was at this uh, value of Bitcoin conference in Munich. 
Uh, it was really great. Um, it was uh, it was also mind blowing and mind boggling sometimes the statements that you had to hear from whatever ex or really active central bankers or you know from the old school. I don't know Keynesianism uh, uh, school, but <laughs> uh, but uh, you know people like Safid and Amuz were there. It, I, I talked to him. It, it was really great the pe- meeting all these people. You know for the first time face to face. Um, so I hope I'm going to see you one day uh, soon, uh, at one event <laughs> sooner or later. Um, so it goes back to my question again: Why Bitcoin? And uh, the uh, the core questions that I had, you know, that I I, I wrote you about. Um, it's this um, it's this chapter in Safid and Amu's book, The Bitcoin Standard, where he writes on his in page ninety six to ninety eight about the the comparison between the 19th and 20th century 19th century the gold standard and the 20th century you know central banking fiat easy money and how under the gold standard and the comparison between you know the the technological innovations um and developments under the gold standard and and compared to the 20th century easy money Uh, so he's saying sort of in 20th century it was more like optimization improvements of a lot of other original you know innovations that actually were developed and came out in the 19th century under the gold, under the hard money. So my question to you is to make sure it is, um, because, you know, the intention purpose of all these questions, interviews is how can we individually, you know, but also in uh, collectively promote, enhance, strengthen the mass adoption of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Either we have pain points like in Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, wherever there's inflation, hyperinflation, people feel it, you don't need to do much explanation, or they comprehend, oh, wow, this is what we can create, this, the chain reaction on that monetary root layer. And this is what most fascinates me, is like we've been burning fuels for like, for example, you know, for like, I don't know, 120, 150 years, I don't even know how long, I'm like, that's weird you know we've been we've been we've been having a lot of technological developments in a lot of other sectors but not in transportation for example just as an example so I'm, so my question to you is um could you explain or from your perspective from your vision let's say you fast forward into the future 10 20 years into the future and we already have and that's like conservative, I think, to be said in 10, 20 years. I think it's going to be with the rate of speed that's going to go on. It's going to be much faster. But let's say we have like the hardest money now. It's hardest money. It's harder than gold. It's scarcest money than ever created in human history. What is the chain reaction? What are the structural transformations beginning? I don't even know, maybe even with the patent system, with the political structures with the technologi- technological and scientific disclosures and innovations, be- bringing maybe together entrepreneurs, engineers, inventors, um, and really bring it on to a new level of civilization? All right, that is the um, biggest question I've ever heard. <laughs> um, how about how about we um, unpack that bit by bit? We'll, we'll start with, you, you opened it with, uh, Saifedean's comments about the innovations being more zero to one esque versus being one to n esque, um, you know, pre and post gold standard. Um, so let, we'll, we'll touch on that first. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't know if that's a, a a hypothesis we can we can validate um, because you know if we remained on the gold standard, you know, we don't know. Um, We don't know whether we would have uh, innovated the same amount as we have, or whether we would have innovated at a faster rate. Um, you know, my my guess is we probably would have. I think what a hard money standard does it 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 makes you prioritize for what's more important um, prior to noise. So, whilst I, I don't know if I agree with the with the um, concept, and I don't know if this is what Stephen was trying to uh, I guess convey with his point. So I don't know if I agree that we've had less innovation or less zero to one innovations um, since the gold standard. But I think uh, we, what is probably trying to say is that if we didn't move away from a hard money standard, we would have had more than what we have right now. And particularly um, probably the signal to noise ratio, I think is really important is that 
in today's day and age, and, and I've said this in articles that I wrote, I wrote this long ass article called um, The 50 Signs the World Has Gone Mad or whatever the hell I called it. Um, and I sort of go in there and it was my, it was my uh, old man yells at cloud moment, right? And I was just <laughs> yelling at the world saying, these are all the stupidities that we're seeing. Um, and a lot of it is a, um, is a function of, you know, cheap, cheap money. Um, it was funny. I, I wrote that, uh, I can't remember if I wrote that before or during reading Saifedean's book or whatever, but I, I remember, yeah, actually, do you know what? It was, I was writing part of it as I was reading Saifedean's book and I was just having this, uh, it was just reinforcing my disdain of the, of the cheapness of the, you know, standard in society with how we approach things. We just, build shit for the sake of building it we consume shit for the sake of consuming it we spend it for the sake of spending it without any you know long-term desire to um i don't know either make something useful or make something last you know and that and that is a function of just how the incentives are uh set up in the world uh, monetarily so um yeah so, so to answer that first piece of the question i i think we've probably had more overall zero to one innovations since we moved across from a um, gold standard. But I think the proportion, which, which is probably what Seyfedin was alluding to, I think the proportion of zero to one and just noisy bullshit um, has probably diminished because we just don't prioritize uh, uh, innovations or all that sort of stuff because money is just so cheap and it's just chasing yield. And the, the, the more money that chases more yield, the more it goes to the fringe. And then sometimes in the fringes, you do get innovation, right? Um, but more often than not, you get a lot of stupidity as well. So, so I think that's sort of the first element. Uh, what was the next part? You had a bridge before you asked me the question about 50 years from now. Um, what was sort of in the middle of that? Yeah, <clears throat> by the way, yeah, you made a really good point because I do think there are, there have been uh, in the last decades um, coming out a lot of zero to one innovations, but not publicly accessible for us, for, you know, for the general public or the civilization. I think it has become very compartmentalized in the corporate military industrial complex. A lot of patents have been confiscated in the name of national security. So I do think there are technology, but it hasn't been like disclosed and, 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 you know, made accessible or, you know, or let alone like mass produced or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So um, the question is, once we have, you know, a monetary root layer, would that, uh, I think, what, um, what was the question? Um, would that, what would would that change the our structural our, our structures within our society our civilization in the you know in uh, everywhere else so so we can really go on that next level um, does that make sense I mean yeah yeah, yeah. okay um th that's a look I I've, I have a, I have a problem with um with the idea that human beings will find a panacea. Um, like a solution that's a panacea to all sorts of things, you know, like where one thing solves the problems across a broad range of things. Because fundamentally, um, you know, what makes us special as a society is um, the fact that we are flawed and, you know, we, you know, we, and, and, and flaws, I guess, are a, a purely just a, you know, a question of perspective as well, right? It's, um, you know, something that is a flaw to one person or one community is a benefit to another, et cetera. So, so I think, um, you know, this idea that uh, one piece is going to solve everything, I, I think that's um, a little bit naive, but I think uh, something where we've got a, um, you know, you, you call it this monetary root layer, you know, in the past I've called it a, you know, a monetary operating system, but, you know, and, and I talk about it a lot in that article, particularly the um, where I wrote why Bitcoin matters. I talked about you know the societal stack that you know communication and the ability to uh, organize ourselves and agree on uh, abstract uh, concepts and shared fictions, as you know Yuval calls them, allows us to be you know the the apex species on the face of the planet because we can you know cooperate both flexibly and in large numbers, etc. Um, and then the the most uh, useful functional and important layer that sits on top of 
you know, communication um, that allows us to uh, cooperate uh, broadly um, and build complex society is this concept of money in whichever way you want to define it, whether it's a you know, store of value, medium exchange, or whatever definition you want to give it. But let, let's just call it a, um, a representation of value. Okay. We, we need to, um, we need to represent it somehow, you know, like you can't, uh, you know, length doesn't mean anything if you can't measure it. Right. So value doesn't mean anything if you can't measure it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I believe that is fundamental for society to be able to function. Now, if we make that better and more robust um, and uh, we, we design it in a way where it's very difficult for a, uh, you know, a small cohort to, I guess, compromise, manipulate, you know, conspiracy theory, whatever you want to... Um, whatever you know, people believe is happening to the uh, monetary system, um, that is a good thing. And that can only have good you know, downstream um, effects. Um, you know, it may have negative effects that we just don't know of. Um, you know, and I don't know how that's sort of going to eventuate. But I guess um, you know, the, the argument is you know, almost anything that we have um, that we can create using something that is um, more robust and more symmetric is going to be better than what we have now right um so how it would affect the deployment of uh innovations that benefit broad you know swathes of society um you know um let's pick one thing like you know let's say the deployment of um you know hydrogen based engines right and i'm sure that's one of those ones that's been sort of swept under the rug that you know oh it's impossible right yeah um yeah but there's obviously some running on that so i think you know would would a would a more symmetric um you know monetary system allow for things like that to flourish more i don't know maybe i, I mean one thing you're not going to take out of humanity until we become cyborgs or until, you know, we really become homo sapiens 2.0, which is not going to be what we are today, um, is things like greed, lust, the desire for power and all that sort of stuff. We're not going to be able to pull that out. I think what a, what a more robust monetary network does is makes it harder for the bad aspects of those, um, you know, the, those, natural predispositions we have as human beings it makes it much harder for us to to behave in ways that negatively impact large amounts of people um and yeah i, I don't know if that specifically answers your question but you know it, it's you know a lot of things would have to change. I mean, even the, you know, the yeah. educational stuff, everything, you know, um, so it's an evolutionary maturity process, I think, uh, that comes together. But I'm just thinking, you know, there's so many brilliant minds out there, you know, innovators, engineers, whatever. I mean, they don't even need, you know, a uh, school age, but there are so many brilliant minds and they have maybe even, you know, invented something, developed something, but now they're going to the patent system and want to, you know, protected intellectual property rights and want to be protected and compensated. And usually, you know, I mean, we know what happened to a lot of whatever, not going down this rabbit hole, but uh, a lot of shit been going on. So I'm thinking, uh, how can we, you know, make this, all these potential technologies servable to humanity on a mass yeah. basis? Well, so, so I, I guess maybe that moves into a slightly different area, which is, you know, I mean, the best uh, form of social system that we've developed to allow for things like that to proliferate um, and help humanity has been capitalism to date, right? Because the, um, you know, at least the incentives in a, in a capitalist system, um, you know, point towards somebody innovating and adding value to society. And as a result of adding value to society, being able to be enriched for that. Um, you know, I, I think the problem we've got is currently, um, you know, like if we talk about Bitcoin, Bitcoin's the most capitalist, the most raw, organic 
capitalist system I've ever seen or heard of, right? Because the only way you can make more Bitcoin is to either do more work <laughs> or add more value. And, and you cannot compromise that. And, and, you know, I love just this idea of, I mean, proof of work. People don't understand how important that is because work and energy is the one thing you can't counterfeit. Um, not in this country, not in your country, not in the world, not in the galaxy, not in the fucking solar system, right? So it's, it's this raw, um, you know, natural capitalist type um, innovation. Now, you know, whilst, you know, the, the, the capitalist world we live in today, the, the problem is that, you know, you have a, a monetary system which is so easy to be uh, manipulated or compromised or all that sort of stuff that um, you end up with uh, the incentives, uh, you know, congregating around not just the innovators of the world, but the rent seekers, the people who don't actually add any value and who leech value away from the innovators and from society at large. And, and, and that, that's not a problem of capitalism. That's a, you know, I guess back to your point is, is a problem of a faulty um, or a substandard, uh, you know, maybe faulty is a too harsh a word, but a substandard monetary, you know, system that we have um, at the moment. So you know, I, I guess I don't know whether, being on a more sound uh, monetary system would make, um, you know, that the, the other, you know, the ability for patents to be released and everything better directly, but possibly indirectly, because, you know, you know if it's indirect, then, you know, the, the, the power structures that feed off the, uh, the asymmetries in a monetary system that allow them to rent seek and, accrue power, which is in effect, you know, more money in order to do the stupid shit that they're doing. Um, they won't be able to do that on a, you know, Bitcoin type system. So as a result, you know, the, the raw capitalist incentives that come from innovating and adding value to society will probably be able to flourish better. So, so maybe there is an argument for that in an indirect fashion. And would you agree that, um, as you know, so Safina Moose talks about this time preference or the Austin economists talk about time preference. So when the individual, I mean, we'll talk about like really people who have never had maybe a chance to, you know, accumulate wealth, accumulate capital, uh, lower uh, their time preference as much as possible and really think and envision something into the future uh, I think individually, you know, and even in groups or in society or civilization at large, they can then interactively, uh, you know, co-invest into one another, uh, but on a long-term basis. And I think this is how, um, this is one point I would agree with Safina Moose. This is how I think uh, uh, this, 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 this uh, civilization, you know, uh, triggers its process of, of evolution. because. You know, it's about not like grat gratifying oneself, you know, in here and now buying a lot of crap, but really thinking and, and, and creating, being creative and developing, uh, researching into the future, long term. Yeah, 100%. Look, I think collectively having a lower time preference um, is fundamentally important for society. So, so I think where we as a society and, you know, and, and what we've been indoctrinated into um, have sort of gotten lost in is, um, you know, people who have a low time preference or societies or, you know, communities that have a low time preference over time, they've been able to either, you know, accumulate or amass, you know, more wealth. They've been able to, you know, innovate better for the long term or build better products, etc. And, and, and they've had an advantage and, you know, you, you could argue that they've um, potentially been happier and they've had more resources. Um, so I think, you know, what the, the Keynesians of the world and, you know, the, you know, modern money theorists or whatever the fuck they want to call themselves these days, the easy money people, right. They, they sort of think that the, uh, you know, these, people who've had a low time preference and created more, I guess, wealth at the end of the road, that they, they have um, confused the end um, for the means. So what they think is, oh, well, look, why should we waste our time, you know, with this low time preference so that we can have more wealth in the future? 
why don't we just have an abundance mindset and just create more wealth now and just give fucking money out to everyone. So, you know, on the surface, without digging deeper, it sounds like it's a fucking great idea. You know, we live in a, you know, a technological world where everything we want is at the snap of a finger. If we want more money, we'll just print more fucking money. If someone is hungry, you know, print more money, give them some food and everything's going to be fine. So, so at a real, um, I guess, call it childish, call it um, naive, you know, call it, um, you know, the, the, the classic uh, veneer of an understanding, you know, the, these people who, you know, call themselves, you know, activists and social justice warriors where they, they, they buy into this veneer of an ideology that sounds nice in theory, but when you start to dig a little bit deeper, you realize that it's, it's absolutely fundamentally flawed from a practical standpoint. Um, they're the kind of people who support stupid ideas like modern monetary theory or, you know, the Keynesian type economics and all that sort of stuff. So I think, you know, the, the, the outcome or the result that we get from having a low time preference and, you know, adopting the, the philosophies and principles of, you know, what the extra Austria economics and, um, and what, you know, really what Bitcoin represents, um, you know, the outcome of uh, having those principles um, is, you know, one of prosperity. Whereas what these other people are doing is they're trying to get the outcome without the principles and without the philosophy. They're just trying to have a shortcut to that. And that's just functionally and practically just not how things work. Um, and you end up with, you know, retarded distortions um, in society as, you know, we sort of see rampant today. So um, I think that that's an important nuance to understand because I don't think, you know, these monetary money... Uh, or whatever the hell they call themselves, modern money theorists or whatever. I don't think they're fundamentally bad humans. I think they're more deranged humans. You know, I don't think the thing is to say, oh, you know, let's do this so that we can take advantage of the little person. I think it's like, oh, let's do this and just fucking help everyone without actually thinking it through. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that color is important when we're, when we're talking about this stuff. So, but yeah, to answer your question, sorry, and I'll finalize on this, is I think absolutely the world needs to move back towards a um you know a collective lower time preference and if there is anything that's going to well move the world towards that um it's going to be bitcoin but not i can guarantee it ain't going to be fucking ethereum um, <laughs> And I don't think we're going back because this is uh, what Safina Mudo says. He says the only competition, the real like threat or competition to Bitcoin would be if we went to back to a like a really sound monetary, like a gold standard. Uh, yeah. And I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, it's just too late for you know, people are already too brainwashed politicians, even then the society at large. I don't think yeah. it's going to happen. I mean, do you really think there's a competition to Bitcoin after all this mess? Uh, not a chance in hell, man. Not a chance in hell. And, and look, I don't. I, mean, I used to be a major gold bug. Um, and and to be honest, in the early days, I was too busy fucking around with gold and silver to even think about Bitcoin. So I, I missed out on you know the first um, couple of bull cycles for Bitcoin. But man, I I don't like gold at all anymore, to be honest, because no matter what we do, um, it, it's nowhere near as verifiable. It's nowhere near as robust. And if we're moving toward a society that is more um you know, more digital, more ephemeral and all that sort of stuff. We ain't going to do it off gold. It's just not going to happen. So yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Exactly. yeah. This is the game. Exactly. Um, would you say, I mean, is that, would that be a challenge? Uh, because there are some, um, uh, there came out some, some articles. I don't know when, who, who that was. Wences Cesaris, I think, or Dan Hell. I'm not, I'm sure who, who wrote those. He said that it might be possible, you know, we, we could uh, reach because we, we have already have like 1 million new, new, new users in Bitcoin every month. How, I mean, how many million do we have right now? 70 million in total? 100 million is an estimate? How many, you know, millions of people we have already on board? Huh? In, in Bitcoin? Yeah, like, like people are already holding, you know, hard lives. I thought it was actually a lot less, to be honest. Really? Unless I, yeah, unless I've missed something. I, I actually think, my, my gut feel is that there's probably less than 10 million people in the world holding a meaningful amount of Oh, wow. Out. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would be my guess. And, and from, from, I mean, 
you know, when I say a meaningful amount, at least, you know, a couple thousand dollars or whatever. Um, I, I think, you know, there's probably a bunch of people with, you know, five bucks in there, or, or maybe they've got like a, a Binance account with a couple of shit coins that are worth $2 now. <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah, I, I really don't think we've, um, we're anywhere near the, you know, the, the 50 or a hundred million mark. Um, I, I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, fr from what I was looking at a little while ago, I still think that again, meaningful is the, the caveat here. I don't think there's a real meaningful, uh, group of, you know, hodlers in the world yet. Uh, I think that's still coming. Okay. Um, what would you say is a realistic challenge? Um, you know, would you say it's realistic that in the next, um, let's say until the year 2024, how many millions of people could, you know, be additionally coming to Bitcoin? And yeah, yeah well, look, I, I think the next run is going to be the biggest thing, obviously, we've ever seen. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to, to say that, right? But um, I, I would say at least um, an order of magnitude larger, um, if not more, if, if not two orders of magnitude. So if, we, if we've got, let's say, five million meaningful hodlers now, I mm -hmm. think uh, by the time the next run is said and done, um, we'll probably have 50. Um, you know, if, if we have 50 already, shit, we might have 500 million. Um, and, and that's why I sort of don't think we're at 50 yet, because I still think this next run is probably going to still have an effect that, you know, is an order of magnitude larger in terms of total holders and total participants. Um, so, so if anything, we're probably closer to the 10, 20 mark, um, if not, you know, five, like what I was assuming. Okay, so what would you say is the critical mass, like the critical number where it triggers the chain reaction of mass adoption? Is it 50 million, 100 million? You know, then it goes really fast. I mean, look at all the, you know, like the iPhone, smartphones, the technology has been adopted. It just needs this, this, tri this tipping point. What, what... Here's, here's the funny thing about tipping points. Um, do, do you remember a time when everybody had, um, do, do you remember a time that was just before smartphones where we all had normal phones? Did you, yeah. you still remember? Yeah. yeah, I do remember, yeah. I'm that old already, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, me too, right? We all had the fucking Nokia 3210s or I don't know what you guys had over there, right? Um, but then can you also remember a time when, you know, we all moved over to smartphones, like, and then smartphones were more ubiquitous. Um, mm -hmm. the, the time in between that, it's actually really difficult to think about the transition. Yeah. Like remember a time when it was all dumb phones and then you can remember a time when it was all smartphones, yeah. but you can't really remember a time when it was sort of like halfway between, like, I don't remember that. Yeah, it was a blackout. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just that that transition is, it's almost invisible. So it's, um, Th th those things are really hard to pinpoint. I mean, you know, in my mind, like I'm, I'm convinced that we've already passed the inflection point for, for Bitcoin. Um, I don't think there's any point in return. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't think this is going away. So, so I'm mega bullish on that. So, so I don't know. Did, have you read the Bitcoin times that really long one that I did? Yeah. Yeah. I read everything from you. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. um, so yeah. So in the Bitcoin times, I sort of talk about it in there and, um, and uh, I just say that th this is, this is, already passed that inflection point. It's already passed the point of no return. Yeah. This has so many um, concurrent type of network effects happening that, you know, any, any attempt to really stop it now is just going to reinforce um, its strength. Um, so, you know, I, I think that inflection points passed from a practical standpoint, but from a, from a global adoption and, and, just, I'll, I'll make a note here. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the word adoption anymore because so many people run around and use it. Like I, I was doing a talk when I and actually, just before I wrote that Bitcoin, Why Bitcoin Matters article, um, I did a talk called Why Bitcoin Matters. And one of the guys in the audience was this young kid who, you know, he was an EOS guy. <laughs> and, you know, I could I see him. That, I saw that debate. Was that sort of a debate where uh, he was like... Um, yeah, in the comment section. Yeah, yeah, he started arguing with a little shit. Yeah, okay, yeah. really hilarious. I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if I that public. Oops. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so he's sitting there and he's trying to debate me about, oh yeah, we've got we've got adoption at EOS. We've got Instagram models posting about, you know. I was like, what the fuck is that for a definition of adoption? Moron. Like, that just made me so angry, man. Because 
I think adoption is just a word that everybody uses in this space. Like all the Ethereum junkies use it. The, you know, the Tron shitcoin morons use it. Like, you know, Justin Tron is now going to run around and tell everyone that he's got adoption because he bought a fucking $5 million ticket to have breakfast with Warren Buffett. And I feel sorry for Warren who's going to have to put up with this idiot for, you know, for lunch or whatever it is. But, you know, I think I, I, what I believe the only measure of adoption that matters right now is how many people buy and hold this fucking thing. And when I, when I refer to this fucking thing, I'm talking about Bitcoin, not how many people buy and, you know, use their Ethereum to pay gas for kitties on the blockchain or whatever other stupidities. And we talk about like a fraction of a Bitcoin. Like we got to emphasize this. Like a, it doesn't matter how much, just, you know, a, a few thousand Satoshis. I mean, that's like what? One Bitcoin equals 100 million Satoshis. So it's enough like every human being on this planet could have like, a, you know, a couple of hundred or thousands of Satoshis. Yeah, correct. So, you know, everybody, so, so the only measure of adoption should be that. So if, you know, I kind of digress there, but if, if we come back to your question, you know, what do we need to see, um, you know, all of these people, like, you know, all the people that um, starting to, um, you know, hold some Bitcoin or, or, you know, if we use the analogy of what I was using before about smartphones, you know, when do we go from, you know, knowing that a few people had it to like all of a sudden just it's normal. Um, we're probably still a couple cycles away from that. I think, you know, if we use the cycles as sort of the harvenings um, or the halvings, I don't know what people are calling it these days, um, you know, maybe 2024 or maybe 2028, um, you know, we'll probably, you know, cross the threshold or we'll cross the point where it's like, yeah, what do you mean you don't have Bitcoin? Whereas now it's like, you know, what do you mean you have Bitcoin, right? So th that, that question I, I presume sometime in the 2020s is going to shift. Um, what sort of number that's going to require? Who knows? It could be 100 million, could be 500 million, but at some point that's going to, you know, that, that's going to inflect um, from an actual saturation standpoint. So maybe maybe we should talk about saturation and total hodlers as opposed to this word adoption because it's just been... The word adoption has been bashed by, you know, yeah. by maniacs out there. So yeah, would you would you see uh, Bitcoin? Uh, it was once uh, coined, or the, the term I, I stumble upon this term, like this this black hole or whatever they call it. Do you see like Bitcoin, the black hole that absorbs <laughs> everything from every other asset and 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 uh, fear? Yeah, and yeah, look, I don't think it's gonna. Uh, absorb everything from every other asset. Um, yeah. It'll definitely absorb the everything, I think, in my mind, with respect to, um, I guess, at least the, the value proposition for digital assets. Um, you know, and, and when I say digital assets, I'm referring to fucking what I call cryptocurrencies, which is Ethereum, Litecoin, this shitcoin, that shitcoin. So th th this is going to be a power law distribution, but such a brutal power law distribution that you know, 99% of the value is going to be held in Bitcoin, um, and maybe you know some partial 1% is going to be in you know, other coins or tokens or whatever. Just thanks to the collective delusions of you know cohorts or you know yeah. communities, right? So, so I think that's you know more how that's going to function. Now, unfortunately, that's probably not going to happen for another few cycles either. I think, you know, the, the, during this, you know, if you've heard of the concept of um, storming, forming and norming, uh -huh. um, if you're familiar with that, we're, we're still definitely in the storming phase. You know, we might be moving into forming over the, the 2020 decade. Um, and during that phase, we'll probably see, you know, another couple of hype cycles and another, you know, uh, slew of shit coins come along with Bitcoin for the ride. But, you know, money and networks that are designed for, uh, collaboration and the the development of complex society like what bitcoin is um and what money is they converge to unity that, that that's the that, that convergent networks they're most useful when you have one of them not when you have many or multiple um and you know w when you start looking at liquidity and depth and uh validator incentive or in other words minor incentive um you know, accessibility, um, how many other people have it. Th th these are network effects which, when they start to accrue and combine, 
you end up with a really brutal power law distribution where basically everything accrues to you know one network and not too dissimilar to what we have with the internet today you know you don't have internet a b c where some people are on you know internet c and some people are on b and the rest are on a right so this is the same thing i think is going to happen in bitcoin now um do i believe some of the value that is stored in other asset classes is also going to get sucked into the Bitcoin black hole. Yes, I do. You know, so I think we, you know, a, a lot of money in the world is held in real estate or in bonds or in stocks or in all these other asset classes for the purpose of, you know, preserving the value because nobody wants to hold cash. Right. So that will also happen. Um, it won't suck up everything from those because, you know, we're still going to hold stocks. You know, I, we're still going to hold real estate. <laughs> you know, we need to live somewhere. We're not going to live yeah. inside our big home. So, so all of that's still going to exist. Um, but yeah, I, I guess me and Murad really spoke about this during um, podcast we did a couple months ago. Is that th this thing is so much bigger than we're, we're imagining at this point in time? You know, th there's a few of us out there who are already sold on the idea that this is going to be tens of trillions or hundreds of trillions. Um, you know, you're probably sold on that. I'm probably sold on that. A bunch of your listeners are probably sold on that. But um, yeah, man, I, I, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying. It, it, a lot of things I think are not predictable because there are some like inherent parameters that are set in stone, such as, you know, the hard cap, the absolute limited number of Bitcoins, 21 million, the halvings, these are set in stone. And then you've got, I think, external parameters, which we don't know. You know, it could be like the trade wars, the currency wars, you know, uh, circumvention of the international reserve currency of the dollar. I mean, all these things are like actually a, a wars that's going on. So if these things, uh, if these external processes, you know, are, are accelerating, that could actually benefit the, you know, whatever we call it, the, the mass implementation of Bitcoin much faster. Yeah, yeah exactly. They're, they're either going to be catalysts or they're going to, um, you know, they, they, look, they're either going to do one of three things. They're going to make it go faster, slower, or they're going to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, like the best traders in the world, right? It's, um, it's either going to go up, down, or sideways. <laughs> Okay, um, Alex, do you have any final thoughts or uh, you want to want to share something with, uh, you know, with the people out there? Um, maybe a good well, advice. I, th there's, um, there's one element and I've just started to give it some thought. I'm, I'm writing an article on it now. I've got, funny, I've got about 80 um, articles that are sitting in draft on my medium. <laughs> so I've started writing, I get this mad idea and then I'm like, oh, I'll come back to it, I'll write it. So at some point, like right now, I'm really like balls deep, I guess, in getting Amber uh, functional, getting it out to more people, etc. You know, um, but what, once I've sort of crossed a couple of these business milestones, I'm gonna all of a sudden seem very prolific because I'm gonna release like article after article after article. But one of them is j just an analysis on how a monetary constant, um, you know, B Bitcoin, twenty one million you know, 21 quadrillion sets um, is going to allow us to build a, uh, a more robust uh, financial ecosystem, much like the, you know, the, the speed of light constant C has allowed us to build um, a better understanding of the universe via physics um, because, you know, nature has these constants and, um, and, you know, we, we've never really had a financial constant. I mean, you know, at the moment, our entire economies and our entire financial ecosystem and the entire financial infrastructure is built off assumption after assumption after assumption after assumption after assumption, after assumption um, mixed with fake data, overblown data, politicized data and everything else. Like, it's no wonder we have no idea what the fuck's going on. Like, you know, we're just chasing shit to the moon, you know, and stock markets inflating and real estate inflating and money inflating and everything. Like nobody really knows what the fuck is going on at the moment. And, and I think 
Um, for a society to, you know, really function well, um, and again, coming back to the discussion we had about low time preference and all of that sort of stuff, I think having a, um, a constant that we can point to and, you know, derive other functions in society from is going to be extremely useful. Um, so, um, the, 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 maybe I'll leave people with, um, that as a, as a question or something to ponder and, you know, maybe an article to look forward to, but also just, just an insight. Cause I know a lot of people get the question and I always get this question is, Oh, so if there's 21 million Bitcoin, then you know, what, what does that mean? What if we have more production in society or what if we have more, you know, people or whatever, you know, that doesn't a cap supply, you know, doesn't that cap society? And, and I think a really important uh, argument uh, for having a capped supply that hopefully your listeners can use in future is that whilst Bitcoin has a capped supply, it is uh, infinitely divisible. Mm -hmm. And what we've got at the moment in the monetary systems that exist is we have a capped bottom, which is, you know, dollars have cents and it's infinitely inflatable. <laughs> so, um, the, that very core concept there, the the divisibility or the inflatability, like which way we go, um, is really, really, really important uh, as a concept because one comes with a set of incentives and we're seeing that in the world today, which is, you know, broadening fucking inequality of uh, income gaps and all, all this sort of weird shit that's happening versus the other one is really about uh, responsibility about adding value about earning, you know, this idea of earning, um, it's, you know, people know that they can earn more of this, uh, form of money. And as society grows and as productivity increases, each individual unit is going to be worth more. It'll have more purchasing power, but we can always divide them. Um, and that, and that, that's what's really important because what that means is you're not diluting people. You're not diluting the value they add to society. Like, and, you know, I guess Silicon Valley people out there or people running tech companies and stuff like that could, you know, probably take a leaf out of this is, you know, when, when you're raising capital, you know, dilution doesn't fucking feel very good. Right. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and, and I think that's such an important concept to understand is, you know, Satoshi could have picked 1 million Bitcoin. It doesn't fucking matter. He could have picked 50 million, 100 million, 21 million. You just, no, nobody even knows why it's 21 million. Like, I mean, you know, I don't know if that number was arbitrary or whatever. Or if yeah, it's I think I read something. It had some, something with the algorithm, maybe with uh, 10, 10 minutes, something like that. Is it? With the uh, timing. It matter. Yeah. But um, look, at, at the end of the day, it, it could have been, you know, if, if the 21 number is important, it could have been 21 Bitcoin, right? <laughs> Yeah, divisible to you know ten billion, right? So, so it doesn't really matter. What's what matters is that this is a digital form of um, this. It's an uncompromisable, unconfiscatable, uninflatable digital unit that is infinitely divisible. So that means we can produce more and not disincentivizing uh, further production um, via the dilution that we have. In, in the current monetary system. So I think that's such an important concept to understand. Um, so yeah, so, so I hope that's, um, that's an interesting yeah. thought to sort of yeah. know. No, great conclusion. Um, I wanna have you back, uh, Alex. Uh, you know what would be fun, uh, have a discussion with you and um, you know, uh, I've had some interviews with Connor Brown, Gigi. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That would be great if, if you guys had a, like a discussion uh, back and forth um, on, on some other topics, maybe uh, which which you know would would go beyond the scope of this conversation. Now. But um, yeah, glad to have you on, um, Alex. Thank you so much. And um, Amber is going to do great, I think, because it's it's really easy, user friendly application, which people you know it's 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 just logical. It's the next next logical step. I think you're going to do I, great I, with that. I appreciate it, man, and, and I, I hope we can take a dent out of coinbase you know because they've started shilling shit coins there <laughs> yeah. so, i mean yeah, it's it i mean to me i i deactivated my my coinbase account a long time ago so uh, i think it's uh, it's not ethical what they're doing 
even in, you know it's starting with the communication or the back and forth hypocrisy so yeah it's, it's disappointing man so I'm, I'm look i'm really happy and vj boy party's just um you know released that uh, i think he tweeted about it a little while ago and it was just as i was writing an article about calling amber a bitcoin business not a crypto company right is that i think we're going to see more of this uh uh vertical building instead of horizontal competition of um you know trying to reinvent the new fucking bitcoin which all these deranged maniacs have done over the last couple of years which um you know so, so yeah I, I hope that you know more people follow the lead that we're trying to sort of uh represent with um with amber and really build on bitcoin um, and try and get bitcoin in as many people's hands as possible and all that sort of stuff so um anyway man thank you so much for having me um I'll add really you yeah looking forward to your next articles and to your you know next uh, presentations <laughs> Thank you, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Vax. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.